always transfer energy without transferring matter. Oscillations or vibrations are passed along instead of the particles themselves. Longitudinal waves are those in which the direction of the oscillations is parallel to the direction of energy transfer, that is, the direction the wave is going. Examples of these are sound waves and seismic P waves. P stands for primary because they're fast. In these waves, particles bunch up, we call those compressions, and when they're spread out, we call those rarefactions. Transverse waves are those in which the direction of oscillations is perpendicular to the direction of energy transfer. They wiggle side to side or up and down. Examples are waves on the surface of water, seismic S waves, secondary, they're slower than P waves, they produce earthquake aftershocks, and light and also every other EM electromagnetic wave too. We can represent any wave, including longitudinal waves, like this. We call this a waveform. Displacement is up the y-axis, basically just how far the particles have oscillated from their original position, and it can be either distance or time on the x-axis. The peak of a wave is called the amplitude. It's the maximum displacement from equilibrium. If it's distance on the x-axis, one complete wave here gives you the wavelength. We give this the symbol lambda for short, but it's measured in meters. If it's time on the x-axis instead, one complete wave gives you the time period, capital T for short. This is the time it takes for one complete wave to pass, measured in seconds. Frequency, on the other hand, is how many waves pass a point every second, and the unit is hertz. So frequency and time period are the opposite. In fact, they're reciprocals of each other. So we can say frequency is equal to 1 over time period. F equals 1 over T. You can often be asked to find frequency from a waveform like this. Measure the time period, then do 1 divided by that. Easy. The wave equation is this. V equals F lambda. That's wave speed equals frequency times wavelength. A ripple tank will tell you what frequency is made. You can measure the distance between 10 peaks, then divide by 10 to get the wavelength, say. Then just use the wave equation to get the speed of the wave. You could also just time how long it takes for a ripple in a tray of water to travel the length of the tray 10 times, then just do total distance divided by time to get the speed instead. The speed of sound waves can be measured by attaching a microphone up to a oscilloscope, for example. If you clap once next to the microphone, the sound can echo off a wall a known distance away, and it comes back to the microphone. Then you can just use the oscilloscope to measure the time it took to travel, then do total distance divided by time again. Just for triple, sound waves cause the eardrum to vibrate, which in turn is converted into a signal that travels to your brain. The human ear can hear frequencies between 20 hertz and 20 kilohertz, 20,000 hertz. Any frequency above this is called ultrasound. Whenever sound reaches a boundary between two different mediums, materials, some of it goes through, we say it's transmitted, while some is reflected. This is the case when we emit ultrasound into a person's body, and a computer can time how long it takes to return off different layers, allowing it to build up an image of what's inside. This allows us to scan babies safely. We can also time sound waves in water to build up a picture of what's under a boat or around a submarine. This is called sonar. We've mentioned seismic waves already, but you also need to know that while the longitudinal P waves can travel through liquids, transverse S waves cannot. That's how we've come to believe that the Earth has a molten core. There's no aftershock felt when an earthquake happens on the other side of the Earth, which implies that there must be a liquid center. When waves reflect off a smooth surface, we say that's specular reflection. That just means not scattered, like a mirror. The angle of incidence will be equal to the angle of reflection. All angles are measured from the normal, which is a line we draw perpendicular to the surface. If light is scattered off a rough surface, we call this diffuse reflection instead. EM or electromagnetic waves are for everybody. They're special because they don't need a medium to travel through. They're the only waves that can travel through the vacuum of space. There are a range of wavelengths in the EM spectrum, which we split up into these sections. Radio waves, microwaves. If you haven't heard the original version, it's a certified banger. Link in description. EM waves are produced when electrons lose energy. They lose the energy as an EM wave. The higher the frequency, the more energy the wave carries and the shorter the wavelength. The only exception are gamma rays, which are actually emitted by nuclei instead. That means lots more energy is involved. That's why they're dangerous. They are all, however, absorbed by electrons. This allows our retina to detect light, for example, phone antennas to receive radio signals, and your face to absorb infrared from the sun and feel heat. UV, X-rays and gamma rays carry so much energy, though, that they can cause electrons to leave their atoms. The atoms have been ionised. 
that can be dangerous if absorbed by DNA in cells as this can cause mutations that can lead to cancer. While some EM waves can be dangerous, we use all parts of the spectrum for communications, cooking, heating, imaging, medical treatments and more. When light waves move from one medium to another, say from air to glass, they change speed. In this case, the wave slows down and the wavelength also decreases. Instead of drawing the wave fronts from above, like what you see above water, we can just draw a ray to show the direction the light is moving in. That's a lot easier. A change in medium also results in a change in direction. This is called refraction. That is, if it's at an angle to the normal, the line we draw perpendicular to the surface. You can think of light always wanting to get away from the normal, but never write that in the exam. If light slows down, it moves closer to the normal. So that means that the angle of refraction is smaller than the angle of incidence. That's the angle that it hits the surface at. Now, all of these angles are measured from the normal. That means you must have your protractor with the zero on the normal. Never have it flat on the surface. It's always perpendicular to the surface. The rest of waves is triple only, so skip to magnetism if you're double. Lenses. Oh boy, here we go. Okay, lenses are curved blocks of glass. Also, you have them in your eyes. They use refraction to make rays of light converge, meet, or diverge, spread out. A convex lens can make rays converge. This is the symbol we use to represent it. If rays enter parallel to what we call the principal axis, for example, the light from an object very far away, the lens will make the rays converge at this point here. This is called the principal focus. The distance from the center of the lens is called the focal length. This doesn't change for a lens, and we can draw it on both sides, and you'll see why in a bit. However, light doesn't usually come from objects infinitely far away, but from objects a little bit nearer. The object could be anything, but we often represent it with just an arrow. Convex lens can then project an image using the light that comes from the object, but we only consider the light coming from the top of the object. And we can do that by drawing two rays. One always goes straight through the center of the lens, and one goes parallel into the lens, then through the principal focus. Where these two rays meet is where the image is formed. That's where you want your projector screen or retina or camera sensor to be in order to get a clear image formed. You'll also notice that the image is smaller than the object, so we say it's diminished. It's also upside down, so we say it's inverted. Things get a bit trickier when the object is very close to the lens. Now the rays don't meet, the image can't be projected. However, if we extrapolate the two rays back behind the lens, they do meet. We can draw the image here, and we can say that it's magnified, it's upright, but it's virtual. That means that it can't be projected. It's no longer a real image like we had before. This would be what a magnifying glass does, for example. Your eye can deal with this diverging light accordingly to make it focus on your retina, but that means that you see this magnified virtual image, so things appear bigger. Concave lenses always diverge light rays. So they always produce a virtual image. With these, our line parallel in goes back through the other principal focus behind the lens. Where it meets the other ray is where the virtual image is. This image is also diminished and upright, as you can see. The magnification of a lens is just the ratio of image height to object height. A magnification greater than one means the image is bigger than the object, less than one, it's diminished, it's smaller than the object. What we perceive as color is a result of different wavelengths of light being emitted by a source or reflected by an object that are then absorbed by the cells in our retina. Most objects will absorb some wavelengths of light while reflect others. For example, chlorophyll in plants absorbs longer red wavelengths of light, which is why leaves appear green. It reflects those shorter wavelengths. This ball looks blue in sunlight because it reflects the blue wavelengths of light. Shine just red light on it though, and it will appear black, as that red light will be absorbed. No light will be reflected. No idea why this is GCSE, but here we go. A black body is an object that perfectly absorbs and emits all wavelengths of radiation. While there's no such thing in reality, it's a useful concept that we can apply to some objects like stars or planets. If a body or object absorbs radiation at a greater rate than it's emitting it, its temperature will increase. But if the temperature increases, that also means that it starts emitting radiation at a greater rate too. So I hope you found that helpful. Leave a like if you did and pop any questions or comments below. I'll see you in the next video.